it's open, it's always that door. What's up? Day in paradise. Doesn't matter. This is Josh, he's my, he's my coach, he's my sensei. So I'm gonna be completely transparent. For years I've just been shooting a bow and I just bring in and let other people do stuff, folks. So all I worry about is putting reps through the bow, putting reps in the gym, scouting, and uh, I think it's time for me to kind of step my game up. So I'll bring you guys along as I'm completely green to setting up bows, tuning bows, Obviously, I've read lots of articles. Obviously, uh, I've been a student, but I haven't ever had someone like hands-on show me. And so Josh has been generous enough to, we're gonna take me through my learning um, curve of technical archery and being a bow smith and none other than my sensei, Josh Jones. What are we learning today? Well, today I think we're just gonna cover two very simple, basic things that everybody should know how to do is how to put a string loop on your bow and how to tie a peep sight into your bow because every bow is gonna need it. Yep. It's better to know it than not. So we'll start with this basic setup here. We'll start putting a string loop on and then we'll do a peep sight. Wow, get two things. Yeah. So you can do it blindfolded and I'm gonna need reps. Uh, <laughs> it's really not that complicated. You just gotta do it. How long have time, you so. been working on bows? Uh, since I could walk pretty much. Um, I started messing with bows when I was like six or seven years old. I started working in a pro shop when I was 10, 11, but my, my dad owned a, a store, so. Um, rather than having like child care, or after school care, that kind of thing, he used to have me to work, and I was really into bows and was always playing with them, and I was standing behind the, the pro shop portion of a counter at like 12 years old. So, to identify where we want to put our knock height, first thing you want to do is try to line everything up with the burger buttonhole or the hole in the side of your riser, which every bow has one. Most of them are uncovered. Some of the Hoyt carbon bows have a little rubber piece over the top of it, but you can still see it from the backside. What I like to use for that is a square. You can use any kind of square you want. I prefer the rounded ones that Saunders makes, and it just helps identify where your 90 is. So you're gonna to wanna to bring it down to where it just lightly touches the launcher of your rest, which this is a limb-driven rest, and I disconnected the cord so it kept it up so we can see where it would be when you drop back. And then I can look down at the bow and see where the burger hole is. And it looks pretty close to square, so it's a decent place to start. From there, just to make it easier, if you look at your square, this is identifying like an arrow shaft coming out of yep. 90 degrees. And if you look at your marks back here, it'll show you where that arrow would technically exist if it was attached to the bow. So I'll we'll take that and I don't see a Sharpie here. Can you Sharpie it up? There you go. So silver really stands out against that serving. That other one's all wore out. So now you know roughly where the top and the bottom of your, like your soft knots would typically go. Normally I prefer to tune my bow without soft knots in it. So I'll put the string loop on, I'll tie it up, I'll stretch it out, I'll run it through paper. And if my paper tear looks off a little bit, I'll move my loop up and down rather than moving my rest up and down because it seems to be quite a bit more effective. It doesn't take quite as much movement to change it. And then I'll go back, separate it, and put the soft knots in. But for today, since we're not running it through paper, I'm gonna go ahead and tie the soft knots in first off. So from here, take your square off. You don't need it anymore. Then you're just gonna get some string material. I would really prefer to use number four nylon. It's my preference. A lot of people will use a braided material, but it, it's, it's a lot stiffer. So when it compresses against your knock, it doesn't have the same level of cushion. This is just a piece of beeswax. Uh, I prefer not to use silicone based stuff because it doesn't stick. It's slippery and beeswax has a little bit more tackiness to it. So when I try to tie it onto something, it'll typically stay there. It won't shift. But we'll basically tie an overhand underhand knots from here to make your soft knots. So just a simple overhand knot like that. And you'll see that's right in line with the 
silver that I put on there. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just do that about a half a dozen times, give or take, somewhere in there. Tying underneath. Everyone has different methods of this. Um, there's some more elaborate stuff that would tie into your string loop. But my concern with that is you're gonna have to cut it all away to try to move it later if you decide you need to move your loop up or down a little bit. And there are situations that would want that. So I try not to tie it into the loop so I'm not actually cutting both things out if I have to move it. Got so, it, so over and under mm -hmm. six times each. And then when you finish, over? no, it, you can do as much as you want. I okay. think we're at about four and I'm gonna stop because that's about as big as I want it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do a single and then a double. And then leave about eighth to a quarter of an inch. Pair of scissors, toss your scrap. And then take a lighter and melt the little leftover tails so they don't unwind. And then that won't go anywhere on there, it won't unravel. And then we'll do the same thing above. And what that's gonna do is make sure that the loop itself doesn't pinch the knock when you draw the bow back. It didn't used to be so critical on your 35 to 40 inch bows, but now the axle to axle is getting so short on stuff, it yep. just increases the angle, and increases the pinch. So if you don't put soft knots in there of decent size, your arrow will pinch and start to float when you draw it back, and it'll give you some really weird results when you're trying to sight things in or tune tuning things. nightmare as well? Yeah, it typically will. It will give you false information. So when you go to put it through paper, you'll get a read and it's you can't actually go off of what it's telling you because that's making it function differently. So we're gonna do the same thing above it. Another piece of number four nylon with a bunch of beeswax on it. So now it what's sticks. the beeswax doing? Beeswax is making this serving material stick. So when you tighten it down, your knot doesn't untie or get loose. So when I get it where I want it, I pull on it and it doesn't try to untie itself. I can actually let go of it. Where if you didn't use that, you'd have to keep tension on it all the time as you were going. And I, I personally believe they loosen themselves up a little easier without the wax. Okay. But it's something I've done since, oh my gosh, like 25 years, okay. just forever. I still use the same soft material that I used back then because I've tried all the other stuff. And it just doesn't react the same way. I still think it's the best way to go. So I'd say four above and four below is probably more than adequate. You get it too big and it starts getting really wide and then your loop gets really big. So we'll do a double on top. All right, so we're back to cutting off and leaving that little eighth of an inch, eighth of an inch so it gives you something to melt. So. All right, so now we have the basis for where our string loop's gonna end up above and below and we have a cushion so when your knot goes in there, it won't pinch it and make it float. So now we need a roughly four and a half inch piece of string loop material. I use Pine Ridge string loop material. If you use BCY or Winners has their own string material, it's actually Pine Ridge's material, I think. It looks a lot like it, but um, they all fray out at a different rate. So you're gonna cut this at four and a half inches and you're gonna pinch it with your fingers and take your other finger and rub it out and make mm -hmm. it bigger. Flare it out so it's more like that. Yep. It's supposed to flush, do the same thing on the other end and then you're gonna melt it into a ball. Turn them into a ball. Try not to get the fire like right on it. Just let it kind of softly melt up. If it catches flame, that's okay, but you're gonna blow it out really quick. And when you're done, you want more of a round shape like that. If it's not round, don't touch it, don't flatten it, because that's what makes it bigger than the loop material itself. So when you tie it on, it won't pull back through. So you're looking for a round shape like that. That's dunk it in some water, oh. let it cool off. Now you can touch it and it won't change its shape. You can push on it and it's the same. Once again, beeswax. Just cake it, cover it. You'll see the color look a little different. See, I haven't waxed there, I yeah. waxed here. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, you can kind of tell it needs some there. And that's really where the compression comes from. So now when I actually tie my loop on, there's three different tools that I use to really get a good compression. Oh yeah. Uh, a guy at home, if he doesn't have these tools, doesn't necessarily need them. Uh, you will need a needle nose pair of pliers. These are a loop pliers. They have- Did you drill those? No, out? they come like that. Okay. But um, they're specific for that. You can use a regular pair of needle nose pliers. It's just a little harder. This is a Viper loop plier. I prefer to use this because it gives a lot of compression. Um, but once again, you don't have to have it. 
it just makes it a little tighter. And I use these to separate, which I may or may not need. So once again, what you can get these? away, that's a crimper, but I, I use it uh, to separate loops when they get too tight. Okay. Push them around a little. Yeah. So I use it for moving them because they okay. once you compress it, it doesn't want to move. So right. sometimes you need to pinch it and open it up a little bit so it'll give. But if you have just a pair of long nose needle nose pliers, not these specific ones, you can usually get away with it. First knot on the outside of the string, come up against the soft knot, go around your piece of loop material, and come back to my side of the string. So when you get it on here, it's just a slip. Okay, so go around the back side of the string, the away from you side, up against this, the soft knot here. Bring it around the back side of the loop material, and around to the front, and then put it back underneath, and pull it tight like that. That's what your loop should look like. So this is one of the places where you'll need your needle nose pliers. So you just pinch the end of it and roll it all the way around itself so you can apply some pressure. Hang on to the string and pull it tight. And if you have a crimper, it helps push it down and tighten it up to that. Now, most people aren't aware of this or don't pay attention to it. You need to tie your knot facing the other direction on the other side. If you tie the knots both in the same direction, when you fire the bow, they'll want to roll in that direction. So you tie one facing one way and one facing the other way so they kind of fight against each other and stay straight and don't move. So we're going to do the same exact knot facing the opposite direction on this side. And this is where it can get a little tricky. So you cinch it up. You're going to need your needle nose again. And I'll pull it real tight because you need every little bit of that length. Wrap it back around. and then just pull it tight, and it's kind of a little tricky to get it down. Take your needle nose, pull it tight, wrap it, push it back through, and then if you look at that knot, it's the same knot, it's just facing the opposite direction. So now we're just gonna compress it and tighten it. Once again, you're gonna use your long nose needle nose. Just stretch it out. And here is typically where I use the true loop pliers because it'll pull on both sides and get a little extra stretch out of there. Without that, you're gonna shoot it a bit and it's gonna stretch out as you shoot it. If you can put those on there, it won't stretch out as you shoot it. And that is how you tie a string loop. And later in the future, if you wear this out, some of your uh, releases have real rough edges, burrs, things like that that make it wear through. Yep. If you go to take this off and replace it, cut one side off, pull it out, tie your knot on in the appropriate direction, and you also have the example of what your knot's supposed to look like. Right. Get it tied, get it snug, and then cut the other side off and do the same thing. So that string that you first put on, you called it a uh, BCY4? No. Uh, no, it's not, that's not BCY, that's Brownell, but they both make the same material. Okay. I can't recall what BCY calls it, but Brownell calls it number four nylon. Number four just, nylon, that stays on. Yeah, that stays on. Like your... it, yeah, so as long as you've left your soft knots on here, you can take your loop on and off 20 times, you haven't moved your knocking point, yep. or your reference of where your arrow goes. That's awesome. So you don't have to retune your bow yep. or anything, just put it back on. So. And basically your knot is on this side, in this side yes. of the nylon. Yeah. So and you had it so it's sucking in against it, but not, it can't yeah. pinch it. And that's part of why you want to use that soft material. Okay. So when it's pushing against the knock, it has a little bit of give. Got it. If you use the braided servings like they use down here or down here, it doesn't give, there's no cushion. So when you pull, it just compresses and pushes on your knock harder and makes it pinch easier.